right. So, um, again, delighted to bring up uh, Dr. Uh, Emma Gutman, uh, again, for a, an update on LP Sharia. It turns out that Emma is not only a world's expert in, uh, in atopic disease and contact dermatitis, but also alopecia areata. And who knew there were so many overlapping areas of immunopathogenesis? So we'll turn it over to Emma. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really came to study alopecia areata a little bit through the back door, just noticing that many of my patients with atopic dermatitis had alopecia areata, but we really are uh, making big strides now in uh, alopecia areata. So my disclosures, um, most of them are from atopic dermatitis, but I do um, have some uh, related to alopecia areata as well. The same, I don't have any patent uh, ownership or any financial gain from any um, drug for alopecia areata. So alopecia areata is a highly prevalent disease in the United States. The lifetime prevalence is 1.7%. Up to 2% of the population at some point in their life will have alopecia areata. For sure, most of the patients will have one or two patches, not extensive involvement, but it's a highly prevalent disease, and many patients will have actually significant involvement. In the United States, we have a total of 6.6 .6 million and around 150 million worldwide. Usually affects the scalp, but can affect many uh, hairy areas. And around 10, and now there are some reports of up to 20% of the patients will progress at some point in their life to have a total scalp, alopecia totalis, or total body hair loss, alopecia universalis. And we all see these patients and understand that it really causes a tremendous emotional and um, psychosocial uh, distress, not only to the patients, but to the entire family. Particularly, many of these are children and adolescents, and it's really heartbreaking. They really many times cry in our offices. For many years, we did not have uh, what to do with these patients. It was highly frustrating. Uh, we had intralesional steroids. Uh, we know that topical, um, uh, topicals usually do not work. Uh, DPCP is very messy. It does work to some extent, but I don't think it's a sustainable solution long term. And uh, many treatments that uh, work, like um, uh, prednisone and cyclosporin and others, you cannot sustain patients long term with these treatments. So we really had a huge unmet need for um, safer and effective treatments for our patients. Now, uh, we knew from case reports and case series that JAK inhibitors that were approved for other indications, such as tofacitinib for RA and others, ruxolitinib or aruxolitinib, uh, worked in alopecia areata. And we need to remember that uh, the immunopathogenesis of alopecia areata, that is still evolving, I think we still do not know uh, everything in alopecia areata is complex and it has evidence for involvement of more than one cytokine pathway and definitely more than one cytokine. So we knew from earlier studies that interferon gamma is important in alopecia areata and definitely it still holds true. But now there are other cytokines that are uh, suggested to be involved in alopecia areata such as IL-13 that belongs to a uh, type 2 immunity, IL-9 uh, that is TH9, a IL-23 that is part of the TH17 axis, even though IL-17 itself a, was shown not to be important in alopecia areata. So thus, a, JAK inhibitors, they cannot really sort out the pathogenesis of alopecia areata because we know they target more than one cytokine pathway. And to do that, we need really to be able to target alopecia areata patients with specific a, immune antagonists. In an early study in 2015, when we became interested in the studies of alopecia areata, I told you because we, we started noticing that many of our patients with um, atopic dermatitis also had alopecia areata, um, Dr. Lebul and I joined forces and really practically in a month, uh, we managed to get 30 patients to give skull biopsies. These patients, uh, we, you all know, are very motivated. 
And we did a big study in these 30 patients in which not only we looked at what happens in their skull, but we also compared to atopic dermatitis and psoriasis to get better insights to see how they fall um, among these two diseases. And we also compared to scalp um, from healthy controls and to um, a healthy control skin. And we were surprised to indeed find that the Th1 immune axis, including interferon gamma and associated chemokines such as CXL9 and 10, are indeed increased in alopecia areata, but so they are increased also in the other two diseases, atopic dermatitis and psoriasis, perhaps marking disease chronicity. But pay attention, IL-13 cytokine is increased only in atopic dermatitis uh, patients and in alopecia areata patients, very similar significant increase, but not in psoriasis. And IL-23 is again increased in all of these diseases, perhaps a little bit more in uh, psoriasis uh, when you compare to a uh, non-lesional uh, skin and uh, uh, to control skin. Now, importantly, in alopecia areata, we see hair keratins being extremely down-regulated, not only compared to a control scalp, but also to non-lesional scalp. These are extremely good biomarkers of disease. So when you have hair growth, you have to have increased hair keratins, and usually you'll have increases in hair keratins way before you actually have a hair growth clinically. So for example, if you want a, to have a biomarker a three months before you actually see notable hair a, a growth, so hair keratins will be a, really good for you to assess that. Another important concept that I already talked about it when um, I talked about atopic dermatitis, but we don't appreciate alopecia areata as having a systemic involvement, right? These patients don't have erythematous lesions, so it's counterintuitive that they will have systemic inflammation. But believe it or not, that data is now building up. There are multiple studies. I present here one study, but there are many studies now showing associations between uh, cardiovascular events and uh, alopecia areata. In this uh, study from a very large database in Korea, there is a time-dependent risk of acute MI in patients with alopecia areata. And also there are studies showing increases in cardiac troponin in uh, patients with alopecia areata. And that uh, builds to another bulk of evidence coming from our group. I present one study, but we, we already published several studies showing increases in the blood in cardiovascular associated proteins and other uh, systemic molecules that are increased. Here we show increases in Th1, Th2, uh, IL-23 related markers in blood and many other immune proteins and cardiovascular associated proteins. And that was a large study, 35 patients and 36 controls from um, one of our residents that is also a PhD candidate at Sinai, Jacob Glickman, that I'm sure you'll hear a lot more about him. He is a big talent. And we saw that patients with alopecia areata had systemic inflammation. And I think that uh, lets us uh, think that we need to treat patients with significant alopecia areata with systemic treatments. Otherwise, they will not improve that systemic inflammation that really is at the base of their disease. So that's something to, to think about. Now, what about the systemic treatment in patients with alopecia areata? So multiple drugs finally are coming into alopecia areata. We are very blessed to have our first approved drug, baricitinib, that was approved, and now we can give it to patients. And there are many others coming, two other um, JAK inhibitors, one from a Pfizer and a Duxorid, I cannot pronounce this name, that uh, is also coming from a cancer, a several biologics that are in a clinical trials. And importantly for you, three large studies with topical uh, agents, topical JAK inhibitors, failed clinical trials in alopecia areata. So I would suggest not to bark uh, at the tree that <laughs> already showed a, a lack of success. Uh, and the reason being, this, these studies uh, were suggested based on work in mice. Don't forget that mice skin is very thin, so of course the topical penetrates in mice, but it does not penetrate the scalp. So I, I suggest to put that at rest. I, I don't think uh, topicals work for alopecia areata. 
Now, these are uh, several studies, uh, phase two studies uh, with JAK inhibitors. Uh, baricitinib already is approved, uh, but pay attention to the differences in study design. The baricitinib study was nine months, 36 weeks, whereas the ritalcitinib and brepocitinib from Pfizer, ritalcitinib is a JAK3 antagonist, brepocitinib is a JAK1 tick 2 As you know, Pfizer moved forward with their JAK3 antagonist. And the study from cancer is with a, a JAK1, JAK2 a antagonist. Again, 24 weeks for a, these two studies. And also pay attention to the different endpoints. And that's also an important consideration when you consider clinical trials for a alopecia areata. The other thing you need to consider is how long these patients had since their last incident from hairy growth. They can have 20 years of alopecia areata, that's okay. But if they tell you that their alopecia areata kept regrowing, that's a good sign. However, if in the last 20 years they didn't have any regrowth, this is not the right patient for the study. And frankly, unlikely that this patient will grow hair also in clinical practice. So these are the data from these studies. A very good data. Pay attention that alopecia areata has very low placebo responses. And that's a consideration. You don't need very large numbers of patients to show a, a good data. But also pay attention to the differences in the time. With baricitinib, significance was achieved at um, the 36 uh, weeks. Um, even though there was differentiation at 24 weeks, there was not a significance at that time. And again, pay attention also to the differences, though, in the primary endpoint. It's much harder to achieve a SALT score more than 20. What does it mean? It means that there is 80% growth of the scalp. So you need to uh, account for these differences. And uh, here you see uh, from our study with ritalcitinib and brepocitinib that there is an inverse correlation between the time since the last uh, episode of hairy growth and the salt improvement. So for sure, you can grow better uh, uh, hair in the patients that don't have a, a long time. So the time when you treat your patient is crucial. So don't wait. It's important to get patients with alopecia areata uh, as soon as possible to our clinic because really time is of essence. And particularly, I think this is a consideration in children. Uh, my lab participated in the mechanistic study of the uh, JAK uh, inhibitors from Pfizer, and these are some changes seen in scalp tissues. Uh, in hair keratins, pay attention that there is a, a, an increase in hair keratins already significant at week 12, and again at week 24. The TH1 axis is downregulated significantly already at week 12, and so is the TH2 pathway, and also IL-1223 also downregulated significantly starting at week 12. Importantly, I told you that TH1 axis is not the only game in town in alopecia areata. Pay attention that with this ritalcitinib, JAK3 antagonist uh, from Pfizer, at week 24, what do you see as the top correlations with hairy growth? You actually see TH2 markers. You see IL-13, you see CCL-17, and IL-9 that also some associate with TH2 pathway. And of course, you see inverse correlations with the hair keratins that are increasing while you improve your uh, disease or regrowing hair. And uh, this is the phase three from uh, the BRAVE 1 uh, uh, and 2 uh, from uh, Eli Lilly with baricitinib. Pay attention to the very severe uh, population that was studied here. And again, a very stringent endpoint uh, that now is required by the FDA, SALT score uh, less than 20. Um, as the primary endpoint. And another thing that is important here, and we see it in all the alopecia areata studies, patients continue to improve after the primary endpoint. So in alopecia areata, you are here for the long game. Many times it takes a year, even more than a year, to grow hair. And you also see that SALT 20 and SALT less than 10 are quite similar. And eyebrows and eyelashes. Again, a high significance in growing eyebrows and eyelashes, and it continues after the primary endpoint. Many patients will tell you, doctor, if you can grow my eyelashes and eyebrows, that's everything for me because you can have a wig. So that's super meaningful to patients, even when they do not grow scalp hair. 
And what about safety? Of course, safety is important for us. There were some uh, mace, uh, very few mace events and um, some uh, uh, non-melanoma skin cancers, but overall there was not uh, any new uh, safety concerns and also uh, some hair disasters um, that were in the study. An important uh, thing, I told you that atopy is very important for patients with alopecia areata, and that was not appreciated. So in these studies, they actually looked how is the improvement or the hair growth different in patients with atopy as compared to those without atopy. First of all, I want to point out how many patients had atopy in the study, about half of the patients, and pay attention that atopic patients respond better. And that's very different than what we used to think in the past. And we know also that patients with alopecia areata have increases in IgE, unlike what we, I mean, we didn't think about it in the past. So atopy is a good prognostic factor in alopecia areata. And this is the study from a Pfizer, the Allegro a, a extension, long-term extension study. And here I want to show you a, the study that they've done with patients with only 25% scalp involvement. So remember, not 50% like in some other studies. And this is a study with ritalcitinib. That's a drug that is being taken forward a, a, to approval that we are expecting this year. And these are very good data, but these are patients, there is no placebo here. So you need to remember that. And this is the SALT score um, equal or less than 20. Really nice data and also very nice data on patient satisfaction uh, that correlates very nicely with the uh, hairy growth in the study. Again, in terms of safety, very similar to what we've seen, there were some uh, uh, two MACE events and uh, there were some uh, 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 malignancies, but not uh, uh, large numbers, and we need to see what happens in real life. Uh, again, patient satisfaction, um, a very nice correlation with the uh, SALT20 responses, much higher uh, patient satisfaction when you have hairy growth. And this is the study from CANCERT, also very nice data, a large study presented recently. Pay attention that at 24 weeks, the slope is still increasing for the primary endpoint that was also SALT score less than 20, and similar data in the other phase three study. And also you see that it correlates with the regrowth of eyelashes and with patient satisfaction. And some uh, pictures, that's from my own clinic, and actually that's with upadicitinib uh, that is uh, hopefully going to be studied for alopecia areata. And that's a patient of mine that actually was in the upadicitinib study for atopic dermatitis, had um, also moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, and developed um, alopecia universalis for quite some time. And she regrew hair in the study after about three months. And these are uh, her pictures. She still is maintained on upadicitinib and has all her hair, as you can see. Now, I told you already that alopecia areata is highly associated with atopy. Multiple studies by now, atopy is really the highest comorbidity. And when I say atopy, it's not only atopic dermatitis, but also allergic uh, rhinitis, asthma. And GWA study also associated IL-13 as the strongest association, and also a population-based study, a very large study from Israel, also associated alopecia areata with atopy. And that, plus our mechanistic data, led to our dupilumab study. That was a small study, 60 patients, 40 started on dupilumab weekly versus placebo. Pay attention that we included patients with more than 30% scalp involvement, not 50%, uh, but we are doing, fortunately, another study that I'll uh, talk about. And also, we put the primary endpoint at 24 weeks. Now, I would have put it later because of the data that you'll see. Um, the patients had to have a, at least a third of them um, atopy um, or atopic dermatitis, and we found that many of the patients actually also had high IgE. And we found that baseline IgE uh, was able to predict responses. So uh, an IgE of more than 200 at baseline predicted better responses, as I'll show you. And there was a very nice correlation, particularly at week 48. 
and uh, we already published two, two studies. One was the clinical data, and one I'll show you a, a slide a soon with the mechanistic data, but certainly the patients that had either a high Ig and or an atopic background responded well, whereas those without high Ig or a, a, without an atopic background, it's not that they didn't respond, but it was much slower and the response was less. And we also published another publication in which we showed that the response correlated with a improvement in quality of life. And I was actually surprised to see when you look at the quality of life measure in alopecia areata, you pay attention that these patients itch, right? We don't think about alopecia areata as being itchy or itching of the scalp, but uh, that's what happens. And this is a... Um, the last slide, uh, the molecular changes with dupilumab in patients with atopy and high Ig. Pay attention that we improved the uh, phenotype also in scalp. And one thing to point out, at 24 weeks, TH2 was downregulated, hair keratins increased. At 24 weeks, there was no change in TH1. That only happened later at 48 weeks, maybe suggesting that TH2 is pathogenic early in alopecia areata, and we will do another study to uh, hopefully support that, some pictures before and after, and a pediatric patient that has concomitant AA and concomitant AD. We are hoping to do an NIH study uh, with dupilumab for children. So uh, with that, uh, sorry that I took a little bit longer. <laughs> And we also uh, launched a big center uh, for alopecia research that um, uh, Benjamin Anger is, uh, has been appointed the director. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.